part of Brass Core that we have encountered since we were on the far east, far western side of his line of battle. Uh, and that's Gibson's, uh, Colonel Randall Gibson's brigade. Three regiments from that, 4th of Louisiana, 13th of Louisiana, 1st of Arkansas. Uh, this brigade was engaged on at least three occasions, four according to its brigade commander on April 6th in the hornet's nest. When you hear the story of the hornet's nest and those repeated charges of the Confederates into that thicket, all through the middle of the day, that is Gibson. When you hear the story of Colonel Henry Allen getting shot through the mouth and then grabbing the colors of his uh, regiment, of his 4th Louisiana Regiment, away from one of Bragg's staff officers to lead that fourth charge with his face streaming blood, that's the 4th Louisiana. Uh, Colonel Allen, I do not know whether he was present with the uh, regiment still on April 7, but um, uh, Randall Gibson's brigade was located by Bragg and thrown forward into the battle at this point, just across the ravine from Claiborne and with some Confederates, uh, Anderson's brigade on the right. We're going to go down there in a little while. Gibson, of all of the troops that reported to Bragg, Gibson and his brigade came in for the heaviest criticism from their commanding officer after the battle. He, Bragg felt that Gibson was timid. Uh, he felt that Gibson was holding back. And that seems to have been part of the reason why he hurled Gibson's brigade into that thicket, uh, ordered it in there four times on the afternoon of April 6th. Um, but indeed, on the morning of April 7th, there they were, still on duty, ready for him to hurl them back into battle again. Um, and it seems strange that that behavior didn't seem to change Bragg's opinion. Certainly didn't change his opinion of Colonel uh, Gibson. But uh, for a regiment that is supposed by its commanding officer, a, sorry, a unit, that is supposed by its commanding officer to have performed poorly at the Battle of Shiloh, Gibson's Louisiana and Arkansas troops went forward according to orders time and time and time again, and each time encountered a bloody opposition from their enemy. By this point on the opposite side of the field, the opponents were uh, the remnants of General Stephen Hurlbut's division of General Grant's army. General Grant's advance from west to east, from right to left, was Lew Wallace, General Sherman, General McClernand, and then gen the remnants of General Hurlbut. In the case of each of those divisions, with the exception of Lew Wallace, uh, the uh, men present to represent the division on the second day of the battle were just a fraction of the men present on the first day of the battle. Uh, we saw the very short line of battle that General Sherman's division presented uh, when we know that the morning before they had 6,000 men uh, available for the battle. Sherman probably had less than 2,000 fighting on the second day. Same would have gone for the remnants of Hurlbut's division advancing across the plateau out of Tillman Branch, uh, or out of, yeah, that's the main branch over there, and attacking against Gibson here. Eventually, by 10.30, Claiborne would have disappeared from Gibson's left, and Gibson had to fall back toward the hamburg Purdy Road with the general Confederate retreat. Yes? What percent of men did Randall get shot at with on the morning of the Sabbath that he had on the morning of the I mean... I don't know that one. I don't know that one, yeah. Um, I get the feeling that, like Claiborne, he, would, he had 800 or 1,000. Uh, men still left. His beginning, and, he, and like Claiborne, his beginning numbers were above 2,000. He didn't he have the 2,700 that Claiborne had, but he probably had close to 2,500. He didn't have very many. No, he didn't have very many of his men left at all on the morning of the 7th. And, and of course, there are only three of his four regiments represented here. The 19th Louisiana is fighting way <laughs> over 
on the eastern side of the battlefield is General Hardy. All right, now it's time to find General Anderson. Find him in these woods. We're not going to do too much talking here at Anderson because the story is pretty much the same as it has been, uh, except that Anderson's brigade is part of Bragg's Corps. And these are so, these, some of these units, 20th Louisiana, 1st Florida Battalion, Confederate Guards Response, uh, have been with Bragg on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and so we can, um, uh, they're pretty well trained and they have good experience and they certainly have the previous day's battle uh, behind them. Uh, General Patton Anderson from Florida is one of the brigadiers in Bragg's Corps. And he held this position, as the tablet tells us, until about 10.30 a.m. And then when the attack went through uh, uh, Jones Field and failed and they had to fall back, uh, he would have had to fall back too. He was also, at some point, apparently, part of the attack that we will talk about next. Uh, and that is the attack through northern Duncan Field uh, by the Confederate Kentucky Brigade under Colonel Robert Trabu. And uh, that, parts of that brigade made a couple of attacks that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And a lot, a lot, I have seen records, I have seen uh, documentation that indicates that Anderson was part of that attack too, or part of a part of Anderson's brigade was part of that attack. But as, as the tablet tells us, after 10:30, after the failure of the 10:30 attacks in the 10:30 line, he fell back in a south and westerly direction until he rallied his uh, brigade in the camp of the 20th Illinois Regiment. We're going to visit them there a little bit later. Uh, now reach the far eastern extent of General Bragg's authority. Or at least the far eastern extent of that part of the line over which General Bragg assumed authority. Uh, we know he was giving people orders all the way out over here. Now that is a little bit unusual, it's a little bit strange, because over here on the other side of the road, that is the beginning of General Breckinridge's area of authority, and over beyond that is General Hardy's area of authority. Um, so at least as of this day in this program, I cannot tell you where General Leonidas Polk was. He supposedly was in charge of the, of the Confederate Center. Uh, but we have gone all the way from the Confederate far left to the center of the battlefield uh, and we know that all of these brigades that we've encountered have been under the command of General Brad. Now as we know, the line of authority or the, the line of command, the command system of the Confederate Army was pretty poor when the battle started and it and that poor line of command was devastated by the confusion of the first day so we know that most of these units that are getting ordered forward are getting ordered forward individually and personally by the corps commanders or possibly by a staff officer from the corps commander uh, in a lot of cases, in most all cases, division commanders don't exist. There's no division line of authority. And in many cases, there's no brigade line of authority. You have uh, General Bragg issuing orders directly to a regiment. That's not the way to run a battle. That's not the way to run a line of battle. That is as long as the one that we have just traced. That's got to be more than a mile, right? You probably just walked over in a straight line a mile and a half or so from our cars. So that is much too much front for Bragg to supervise individually. 
but he has to, because that's the nature of this battle. The Confederate command system is broken down, and he has to. He complained in his report that the breakdown of the order of battle caused corps commanders and their aides to have to do the job of file closers. Now he's, uh, he's engaged in a little bit of Braggian overstatement when he says that. A file closer is usually done by sergeants or junior lieutenants. But the fact of the matter is the, the corps commanders and the staff officers, while they should be involved in com coming up with a strategy, coming up with grand tactics, ordering consolidated attacks, setting up consolidated defenses, they are spending a lot of time whipping stragglers back into line. They are spending a lot of time telling someone where to go find some ammunition and who to ask. They're spending a lot of time on the responsibilities of lower level commanders. Now early on the morning of April 7th, Colonel Robert Trebu and his Kentucky Confederate Regiment were camped in what is uh, now considered, what we consider, McDowell's camps. Uh, it's out by the Hamburg Purdy intersection with Highway 22. Colonel McDowell at his headquarters there. When the firing began that morning, the Colonel started looking around for someone to report to. He found General Bragg, because General Bragg was in charge of that side of the battlefield. The Kentucky Brigade belonged to General Breckinridge's Reserve Corps, not to Bragg's Corps, once again. But Bragg gave Colonel Trabu orders to move east along the main Corinth Road and take position in the line of battle. He did that. He worked his way in this, in this direction. And early in the battle, he was tied in with uh, General Anderson. And quite possibly, there isn't a tablet to denote it that I've seen, but quite possibly a good portion of uh, Milton Russell's Tennessee Brigade. But we saw some of them down on the far west side. And so at some point he was tied in here. He received orders to move to the south, to cross the uh, road. And upon doing that, he would tie in with his own division. His own commander, General Breckinridge, was down there. As the Kentuckians began to move off in that direction, General Bragg came up here and detached two of the units from the Orphan Brigade. They're not called the Orphan Brigade yet, that's a Stones River thing, but from the Kentucky Brigade. The 4th Kentucky Regiment under Major Thomas Monroe and the 4th Alabama Battalion of Infantry um, under, I believe, Major Clinton, but I hope it's not on the test. Clifton. Clifton's Alabama. I think that's what we were talking about. But the uh, Alabama Battalion and the 4th Kentucky Regiment. 4th Kentucky at this time was over here in these woods. He was on the far left of the Kentucky Brigade. And then next was Clifton's Alabama. Bragg came up and personally detached these two regiments from Trabu's brigade. Trabu didn't tell Trabu about it. He marches off straight in that direction. And Bragg ordered those two regiments to attack straight across this field and through these woods. They were straddling the wood line against a large force of Union troops that were coming up out of the uh, upper end of Tillman Branch Ravine, right here. On the northern side, on our left, was the regular brigade, and then the 1st Ohio, uh, Ohio Regiment, 6th Indiana Regiment. These men belong to General McCook's division of General Buell's army. So Bragg has now stretched his area of authority far beyond even the three, uh, beyond Grant's army, Grant's army, and he is now facing parts of Buell's army. He orders this attack. The attack goes in against the regulars. 
uh, Major Monroe in the 4th Kentucky through the woods, Clifton's Alabama through the fields, and they get involved in a very heavy firefight on the uh, western end, uh, on the eastern end of North Duncan. They fell back. General Bragg ordered them to attack again. In the second attack, they may well have been supported by Anderson's brigade, whom we just visited. Launched a very heavy attack, the second attack much heavier than the first, through the fields and through the woods, and got inv involved again in a very heavy firefight. The uh, casualties among the regulars were very heavy over there. The casualties among the 4th Kentucky were very heavy over there. Major Monroe from Lexington was killed in the attack. Also, Governor Johnson, the Confederate-aligned governor of Kentucky, who had uh, been forced to flee Kentucky when Kentucky stayed with the Union, Governor Johnson was riding with Johnson's army in the hopes that a victory here would carry Johnson's army back into Kentucky and Governor Johnson could take his seat in the governor's office. On the second day of battle, that looked like it was going to be less likely. Governor Johnson had had his horse shot from under him and killed, so he joined Company E of the 4th Kentucky Regiment, Monroe's Kentucky Regiment, joined as a private. Picked up a musket off the field, picked up an abandoned cartridge belt, filled it with ammunition, and went into the battle. The governor went into the battle as a private. And in that second attack with Major Monroe, Governor Johnson was mortally wounded, left on the field and picked up by McCook's troops and soon died. I believe he died on the same day. After the two failed attacks, Confederates fell back to this position and finally um, uh, the 4th Kentucky Regiment and Clifton's Alabamans were able to rejoin uh, Colonel Traub, Colonel Trabu, as they retreated back toward the crossroads. Let's head off in this direction. Kentucky Brigade had two artillery batteries attached to it which is pretty neat. Uh, most, uh, most, uh, most Confederate brigades only had one, some didn't have any at all, but the Kentuckians had two batteries to support them, Cobbs, Kentucky, and Burns, Mississippi Battery. Burns, Mississippi was in, uh, uh, participated in both of these fights. They were in position here until 10.30. At about the same time, those attacks were made across North Duncan Field. And they were firing in support of those attacks, and they're also dueling with uh, two batteries of General Buell's army who were on the ridge line across the ravine over here in what is known as the Hornet's Nest, what we still call the Hornet's Nest. Uh, but uh, Captain Bartlett's Ohio battery was up over there. And also for a time, Captain Mendenhall's regulars were up over there. After the 1030 attacks all along those lines, they were driven back by the Federals with heavy casualties. The Confederates fell back toward the Hamburg Purdy Road, and we're going to start following that uh, uh, that right now. So let's head straight on down the road. This will be an easy walk, and you should be able to find where we're going. <laughs> Along with Pond's brigade, they had successfully convinced. Lou Wallace and William T. Sherman that they would face severe opposition if they attacked across Tillman Branch when they decided to do that. It's part of the reason that those divisions didn't get across Tillman Branch until about 9 o'clock. By that time, Ketchum had fallen back to this position. Now from this position, by about 10.30, the focus of the battle is in this area is a little different. Across the ravine in this area, the Confederate line of battle is starting to come together around the edge of Jones Field. And at about 10.30, they're going to make that attack into Jones Field. 
At the same time, Ketchum is slightly behind them and to the west of them and is oriented more or less. He does fire this way and participate in the bombardment, but he's also firing against elements of Lou Wallace's division across the ravine here. And Lou Wallace's division, uh, his first brigade under uh, Colonel Morgan Smith is deployed right there in the picnic area. And he's deployed against Pond's brigade, which is across the road, across Highway 22, in this direction, and fighting Ketchum's brigade. Now Wallace has an entire division of three brigades to work with. But again, he's very, very conservative in his movements. He's very worried about maintaining contact with Owl Creek on his right and maintaining contact with General Sherman on his left. Now, as a result, he doesn't really concentrate on the power of the Confederates in his front. And it's unfortunate because the power of the Confederates in his front was very, very weak at that time. But mostly during this time, around 10.30 or so, 10.30 to 12, Wallace stands more or less still while his left flank, while Sherman's division, while McClernand's division deals with the fight in Jones Field. So while that fight is going on in Jones Field, for the most part, Wallace's men are standing or laying down in line of battle uh, across Highway 22 and into the South Field where the picnic area is. Let's head straight west here to Division. They have a pretty good illustration of location of that tablet and location of that tablet. Now those Union soldiers were not here at exactly the same moment those Confederate soldiers were there, but nevertheless the juxtaposition of the tablets gives you a very good impression of just how far beyond the Confederate flank Wallace's division was. Smith is the left of Wallace's division. The rest of his division stretches on in that direction. Confederate line of battle is over there and pretty much the battle is happening to the left of Wallace's division. Yet he doesn't participate, he has these other priorities. He does wish to, he has to keep contact with Owl Creek and he has to keep contact with Sherman. So he moved to this position at about the time these Confederates were retreating from here but he still had opposition. Pond's brigade of infantry fell back beyond the ravine we just crossed on the highway and was in line of battle on the next hill. Ketchum's battery was bombarding them from over here. Like I said, they took part to some extent in the artillery duel over here, but they also turned their guns to play on Wallace's division as they deployed here. And they played some havoc as well. Uh, the 24th Indiana Regiment was in line of battle right here when they were struck by a barrage from likely from Ketchum that killed their lieutenant colonel, killed two other officers instantly, killed three of their men and wounded a lot of others. Uh, this is uh, a heavy loss occurring to a regiment that was not in the battle on the 6th and had not yet seen combat on the 7th. They just marched up to this position, took their position, and were subjected to that artillery. So what did Bragg accomplish with his early morning fight? A number of things, although ultimately, as we know, he was driven from his position. Most importantly, he accomplished bringing an army to the field at all. The Confederate Army on the morning of April 7th was totally dispersed among the, the Union camps back here. Now the men were ready to fight, but they needed someone to give them directions. And Bragg provided that leadership on the western side of the battlefield. He may have presumed a lot by giving orders to people who were well over on the center of the battlefield but he certainly saw that someone needed to be in charge 
of a very weak line of battle in on the west side of the battlefield. So he accomplished getting the Confederates together to fight in the first place. Second, and here Colonel Pond and his brigade deserve some credit, they did convince an already conservative thinking Union leadership to wait, to wait a fairly long time before they made a serious attempt to advance through this area. Sherman and McClernand moved very, very cautiously. It took them a long time to get through Dill Branch Ravine. Once they were through Dill Branch Ravine, they stood and waited while they brought up artillery through Dill Branch Ravine, got the artillery in position, engaged in, a, in an artillery duel in a bombardment with the enemy, and a battery, in a battle where they first moved, they first stepped off at 6.30 in the morning, they finally got into a major engagement at 10.30, between 10 and 10.30, over here in Jones Field. So, with Bragg, Colonel Pond accomplished this show of force that kept an already conservative thinking Union leadership, thinking conservatively. Finally, when Bragg's forces were driven from this position, he, he successfully managed to rally them at the Hamburg Purdy Road, and he continued to command the western end of the Confederate line through those desperate hours from noon until 2 or 2.30 back there along the Hamburg Purdy Road. There'll be a program later today where uh, one of the Rangers will take you around the crossroads talking about the fighting at Hamburg Purdy Road. So for a, for an army, for a part of an army that lost this part of the battle and then eventually were on the losing side of the battle these exhausted, disorganized, hungry, for the most part, and ill-armed and ill-organized Confederates accomplished quite a lot. They could have been simply bowled over. Now that might have happened if Wallace and Sherman had moved quicker. <clears throat> but they could have been simply bowled over. Instead, they managed against with all the odds against them to put a line of battle together and to give Wallace and Sherman and McClernand a bloody and protect, protracted fight before they retreated to the Hamburg Purdy Road. Thank you very much for coming out today. That's the end of our first program.